I guess I'd just start by saying, you know, how honored we are to be able to put this capability up for Mexico, and, you know, provide their, you know, uh, their capability for you know, rural phone service and their national communications. So it's an important mission, and you know, we're pleased to be able to do it. And I am so proud of my guys. Oh my gosh, 100 launches in a row. It's uh, it's an unprecedented record. It is a, a tribute to the fleet of rockets and to the hard work of our people that think about mission success. But also, I, you know, I, I always see something like this, and I think, you know, really what a milestone, you know, and tribute to, to just human will and determination and inventiveness to go to space to do something that Mother Nature just really does not want you to do and to do it successfully. For nine years, on an average of one a month, uh, I'm just, I'm just amazed. And of course, it was a beautiful mission. We got up. We had a little bit of excitement with the boat that wandered in. <laughs> and <laughs> we were a little bit worried because it was a small launch window. It was only about 19 minutes wide, and uh, when you recycle from inside T minus one minute, it takes about 10 minutes to recycle. So we worried whether we'd fit it in, but we did. And uh, I think that was about a 23,000 mile apogee. And we dropped the satellite off within one mile of this. It shouldn't even be possible. So we're so pleased. And, I, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. I know that you've often said that you do this kind of one at a time and that's your secret sauce, but is there anything else that um, you think uh, ULA needs to be paying attention to, particularly as you're moving towards getting away from the maybe redundancy or some of the requirements that you have with Air Force and you move more into the commercial way of doing things? Well, absolutely. This is a pretty exciting time to be in the space industry because it's matured to the point where there's now multiple providers and there's competition, and so it's an opportunity for us to you know, transform our business. And I think in doing so, maybe revolutionize you know, the launch industry at the same time. So there will be a lot of transformation in ULA. We are shortening our cycle times. So we're going to launch rockets for half the cost and half the time. And we are well down that journey already. And so as we do that, our task is to stay focused on the things that make us successful because we are not going to take risk with mission success and not just because that is a differentiator for us in the marketplace and really the reason why we had the opportunity I think to do this mission for Mexico but also because of the gravity of what we do the satellites we put up are always an important piece someone's mission, whether it's a, an element of national security that's on keeping us safe, or whether it's a commercial mission where a tremendous investment has gone in and people have spent years putting a spacecraft together and are going to bring capabilities that make the world a smaller place and make people lives better. I just, uh, you know, I, I just feel you must stay focused on the gravity of that mission and to take risks with mission success is, is just not acceptable. Mr. Hi, James. Uh, not many of you have been watching it as much as some of my colleagues and, and, and you, I'm sure. Um, I am yeah, envious of you. You <laughs> <laughs> think it that way. Um, uh, 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 update on the status of the RD-180 inventory mm -hmm. and what the year's legislation is going to allow you to uh, get sure. an addition for um, or national security launch against mm -hmm. uh, this crisis limit for you, or uh, where, where, you know, while you're celebrating the success of that, something to worry about? So I'm happy that Congress has started working on this problem. Um, we are given, we are allowed, uh, in this NDAA, assuming it's signed for law, four engines. So that's a start. It's not sufficient for us to bridge the time required to replace it with an American engine. So there is much more work yet to be done. And, and I certainly encourage 
Congress and the government to help us get through this. So that's, uh, you know, it's, it, it takes a, a quite a bit of time to develop a rocket engine from scratch. These are the things you can buy off the shelf. We are going absolutely as quickly as we can. That's one of the reasons that we partnered with New Origin, because they were well into their development. They're making excellent progress and gaining confidence every day as they continue to run the tests. And I believe uh, that our, our colleagues at Blue did a press release just a couple days ago and talked about their, their test series. Very robust, great, you know, great progress. But this is not enough engines. Uh, we're going to need more. We need uh, at least 14 that's provided as four. Without those engines, we are unable to fly Atlas in the national security marketplace. So that would take the workhorse of what has put two thirds of the uh, you know, nation's most critical capabilities in the orbit out of that market and uh, really almost kill competition before it's had a chance to get started. Because I, I can't compete if I can't bring a rocket to the marketplace and the rocket has to have an engine. So I, Four, more than four to sustain that. Yeah, I'm probably just wondering how many do you actually have now? Uh, okay. Yeah, so you know, we have, I'm going to think for a second, uh, the current inventory. I'm, going to, I'm not going to give you the precise number because I don't remember off the top of my head, but you know, we have over a dozen engines in inventory in the factory. They are all committed to missions. Several of them are in flow. As of about uh, a couple hours ago, we have one less. And so they, they are working their way down. You've heard us say in the past, when asked about you know, potential threats to availability, for example, we have said, well, our mission has been to provide assured access to space. And that was in Delta, and we maintain enough Atlas inventory in the pipeline to go the two years it would require to shift to Delta. That was true before last year's NDAA bill. And it doesn't mean I have two years of excess inventory to change my mind. It meant that I had enough analysis to burn down the Atlas inventory over the span of two years. Because of the uncertainty last year created by the NDAA, we did not purchase our d 180s that we normally would have. So we have been working our way down through that reserve ever since. And so you know, we will be in a position of having difficulty managing the flow in the factory very soon. And just to clarify one capacitor the whole debate, I guess, is that it has no effect, no bearing on your, your NASA launches. Correct. This only right, this this restriction only applies to engines that are used for national security space missions. Can I ask you just a clarification on that? Is um, when you use an RD-180 that was purchased before the ban, such as the one that flew this right. morning, you can't now, because that's a commercial mission or for the orbital flight coming up in December, you can't then like borrow again. You can't say, oh, well, we that was one of our allotted RD-180s. And we, now we need to make up one. Sure, so, borrow, pay back. Right. So I, could, I could, and that's what I've been a little unclear about. So when you're looking forward into, I realize if you're bidding on commercial missions that you haven't bought engines for, it's completely oblique. But for missions that are on the manifest, you've got four next year that are not military satellites on the Atlas. Is that feeding into the availability of the RD 180s that you could be using for military missions? So yes, the way the law works is it specifically uh, limits us to engines that were ordered and fully paid for prior to the outbreak of hostilities in Crimea, which are defined by the government as the 1st of February of 14. And so a borrow payback, because we consumed an engine that we had on the shelf, say for, you know, for a NASA mission or for a uh, commercial mission like today, say, okay, I use one of those, I'll just replace it with an engine that purchased afterwards is not allowed. Unless it's for a commercial mission right. afterwards. We can, we can fly engines that are not national security space, right. but we cannot consume a national security space okay. engine that would have been allowed for 
for national security space and then replace it with a later purchase that's not allowed. So since the February 1 date, you're, by the time uh, you go through your 2016 launch manifest, you will have used up at least five, and I can't remember if Intel sat or whatever else fell under that. So you used up basically half of your inventory on non-military missions that you can't replace. All right? Yeah, so in principle, yes, I'm not sure I followed the math because I don't remember exactly yeah, how many yeah. engines I, I have in inventory. Okay. But yeah, I mean, that's basically the idea. You know, we fly, as we say, we fly on average once a month, sometimes more often. Um, two thirds of those are Atlas, consuming those engines. So you can assume, for as a rough you know, rule of thumb, that we're going through uh, an RD-180 for someone about once every six weeks, if not once every four weeks. And 16 is a particularly busy year for us. We'll fly 17 times next year. And again, the majority of those will be Atlas missions. Which you can soon be already money. Yes, Stephen Clark has six right now. Um, question, you mentioned uh, you did not make a purchase for RD last year, but the, uh, the law only restricts usage for national security missions. Why not make the purchase if you can apply those to commercial and mass missions? Sure. Yeah. Because in the next several years, uh, the National Security Space Missions continue to be sort of the core of our business or the core market until they begin to trail down out a few years from now. And so with an outright ban of the RD-180, which essentially bans the Atlas from the marketplace, uh, this put a lot of risk and uncertainty into what the future will hold. When we purchase long lead materials like engines, unlike other defense contractors, we largely fund that ourselves. And they have to be ordered in large batches from the Russians. And so it is a considerable financial outlay because of last year's bill, which by the way is still in force until this bill is signed, that is still the law of the land. We were unable to close sort of the risk, you know, investment kind of you know business mathematics around that and we delayed the purchase from January until today. We still have not purchased. And, and with so few engines available to me, um, this, how does that affect your decisions on whether to bid? Do you plan on bidding the first five or first nine or how many engines you have and the software are you going to be selected and what you bid as these competitions for a lot of this RP or out? Sure. So today I still have no engines to bid because, uh, the, uh, again, last year's law is the law. So I am able to bid the current RFP that is out until and if this bill is signed and we are provided with engines. And at that point, it's like any other bid opportunity. We bring the RFP and we decide if we're going to participate. But right now, none of that can happen until I have an engine. So if the, if the law is a change of the time, the bids are due for this RFP. Then I would be unable to bid, literally be prohibited from bidding. Because you don't have the engine. Because I don't have an engine. So I would not have a product to offer in my proposal that complied with the law of the land. SpaceX can double the price. No comment. Additional questions about the launch? Well, I just wanted to know about uh, Mike Wagner and U.S. launch report. Uh, manned space flight, do you think you'll be using uh, the Alice rocket still or will it be the Vulcan? Yes, we are planning to take Boeing CST-100 Starliner uh, in 2017 back to the space station with astronauts. We're very excited about that. There's, you know, these are important missions, but there's a, there's a certain thrill and responsibility, you know, like taking Americans to space on an American rocket. Very cool for us because it will go back to space, they will go back on an atlas, really the first rocket of Americans went to space, and we will use the atlas for that mission. Hi, um, Laurel Ann Whitlock with um, Spaceflight Insider. I was just wondering, since 100 is obviously a big monumental number, and you've accomplished so much in the first 100, what are your top goals for the next 100? Oh, to completely transform how space is used. So 
you know, our goal is to make space so much more accessible than it is now. You know, as I, I think I mentioned when we started, you know, we want to cut the price of lift in half. We want to cut the time it takes to, to, to have a launch occur in half and make space very, very accessible in order to make it possible for new missions to appear in space. So within that next hundred launches, which could, you know, let's say 10 years, maybe it'll only be, uh, it'll only be five years, maybe we'll fly 20 times. What do you think? Could you keep yeah. it up? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm ready to support, sir. <laughs> so we'll continue to see the missions we see today, but we'll, I think we'll also see greater and greater utility and smaller satellites. So we'll see new missions opening up that are able to be done that way that we don't see today. Small sats, nanosats, even microsats. And uh, we're just on the very threshold of a, of a true, you know, space-based economy. So we talk about cis-lunar, you know, space between here and the moon, and all the potential economic activities that we are going to make practical with our Vulcan rocket, and it has its advanced upper stage, which we will do immediately after the new American engine, that will make it practical now to build very large structures in space, taking them up a piece at a time and assembling them there with the upper stage that can literally fly around for a couple of weeks and create the infrastructure that will be necessary to see that. So we're gonna see private habitats in space that, you know, functionality like the International Space Station, but commercial and private in nature. And we're going to carry those up, as well as a whole host of economic activities. And when we are able to make money in space as a space-based economy, then people will live and work there. And within that window of the next 100 launches, you will see a permanent expanded human presence in that cislunar space. A thousand people living there and working there. That's what I see in the Just to go back a little bit, uh, as far as the Atlas and the use with uh, other commercial vehicles, sure. um, can you expand a little bit more on uh, the, uh, your relationship with Sierra Nevada? Oh, sure. So uh, Sierra Nevada is, is uh, you know, also a, a you know, potential carrier of, of cargo and crew to the space station. Um, they're a great company, just between you and me. I, love that vehicle they have, that lifting body, I think that thing is just awesome. And so, yeah, yes, we are working together and we are looking to help them, you know, achieve those goals. Um, I guess I probably can't say much more than that. Okay. They should show. I like your hat. Uh, one of these days I'll get one of yours. <laughs> Make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> A Vulcan hat. Yeah, 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 uh, this is uh, your second launch in less than a month, or one month, and you have another one coming up at the end of this month. Yeah. What are you doing, uh, you know, a few specifics of what you're doing to increase the span between Atlas launches, uh, you're increasing workforce, ship changes, off-site processing, what are you doing to really drive down the span? Yeah, sort of all of the above. So there's a lot of cross-training to make our people more, more uh, uh, versatile, and then, you know, we have a, you know, a very reliable you know, sort of processing sequence that we go through to integrate and launch. But with 100 launches under your belt, half of those being Atlas, for example, you got a lot of data on exactly how that works and what you can do and can't do. So one great example was the, uh, the technique that we first applied on MUOS, that previous launch, where we integrated the spacecraft with its structure off of the rocket indoors. And that did a number of things for us. So it took us out of a serial flow of events that have to happen in the vertical integration of the rocket itself, and it reduced our exposure to weather delays, because there are certain things that you can't do with the spacecraft when weather conditions are in a certain, certain state. And with all of that together, that one step took five days out of the launch span. And uh, now it is baseline, and it's very you know, very reliable, and it's what we'll do every single time. There were, are a sequence of things like that, and there are more to come. We have basically, since the beginning of ULA, shortened the span to integrate and launch in half. We're now going to
cut that in half again. And does the same day rollout that you use for this launch, is that something we'll see for all the missions going forward to put it out? You're going to see that going forward. As you look toward the future, um, do you, aside from just the general anxiety, is the quarterly funding that the parent organizations are currently providing for Vulcan um, an impediment at all towards the rotor development? And would any you know, potential acquisition by Aerojet or anybody else do anything to alleviate that? Is that anything that you particularly concerned about or interested in? So, you know, any, any good development plan has uh, regular milestones and, and gates associated with it, so we're making decisions about whether you're ready to proceed to the next step. And we would, we would lay out a, a program like this with at least quarterly milestones already. And so we have just synchronized those with uh, these events for the board. And so in terms of the forward progress, no, it is not really impeding us at all today. But it does represent the fact that the parents are having, the parent companies, our two owners, are having trouble seeing us close that business case so that they can fully commit to the entire development. And the two things that you know, we're looking for is certainty in the RD-180, because that allows us to fly Atlas which generates the cash that I turn and plow right back into the development of the Vulcan rocket. And then, of course, we are also interested, if anyone would like to help us, we'll always accept any help that they might give us. Now, in terms of uh, you know, the engine development, the engine is moving at its pace on its schedule, and no, it is really not yet impacted by this. But should we be unable to close that business case, if we can't have engines to fly rockets to stay in business during the gap, then one of those quarterly milestones would be a blue stop. And of course, the world changes for us. So if, when NASA comes out with their uh, cargo risk fly phase two awards, um, do you end up winning contracts for like two of the carriers, say the Reagan series, you know, just sure. whatever? It's conceivable that you might even have not just one, but perhaps two customers out yes. of that. Does that in and of itself help kind of close that gap, you think, for Boeing and Lockheed? Or do you think that the only the only other options out of the conundrum are RD-180 issues or very not funding? Two awards are not enough to close the gap. Two awards are better than one. <laughs> Tried to figure out a way to get on SpaceX's team, but it didn't seem to work out. But I don't know, two would be fine. Just yes, Cyber America Space. How happy is everybody that how fast you turn around when? I'm sorry. First time. You haven't done this rollout launch for a long time in one day. How happy are you that it worked the first time? I'm with, thrilled. With all the crew changes <laughs> you've done. No, I'm absolutely thrilled. But, you know, we, we had very high confidence going into it practiced and we analyzed and we studied and you know we put together good robust plans you know what if this goes wrong what will we do we'll do that and really thought our way through it but these are big complex operations and uh, no matter how well you know you prepare and you plan there are always things that other nature can throw at you or surprises so I was very pleased at how well this has worked and it just gives us that much more confidence in the future and this is the plan for the future then the only thing it does to us is we can't focus on something when we try to set oh, cameras up. Sorry about that's that. That's probably not I've what I've already objected to the schedule, <laughs> and I don't think we're being heard, but it's okay. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> we had a request to schedule all launches at dawn, so you can have that clean. Yes. I don't know if I got yes. it. We can probably work on a few couple more requests. Yes. <laughs> We've talked about this bit, but Delta, of course, has mm -hmm. a more finite, I guess, uh, uh, history. It does. Uh, and, uh, what is the number there? So we intend to uh, sort of build the last Delta in 2018 and we'll fly in 2019, the last Delta single stick, Delta medium rocket. And then that would be the point that Delta is retired. Off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly how many missions that is, but Jesse, we can get that for you, for your story. Um, I have promised the NRO, who is our primary consumer of the Delta Heavy, as well as the occasional NASA really heavy science missions, you know, like you know, SPD, um, 
that we will continue the Delta Heavy until they are e you know, able to easily and gracefully transition to the final version of Vulcan, which has the capability to retire. So I anticipate the Delta Heavy, the three-core version of Delta, continuing into the early 20s, uh, and then it will be retired. And of course, those aren't very many missions. You know, the Delta Heavy flies every once every couple, two or three years. So it's a, it's a handful. So uh, I mean, it just seems like kind of scary, you know, with the situation there where you've got these this grand ambitions and goals to transform and stuff, and yet you just run out of rockets in a short-term <laughs> period of time. It's like quite a, a start in contrast to what you can do sort of particular thing here. Well, the job wouldn't be fun if there wasn't an assignment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think we have a bright future, and I am optimistic. And you know, the the notion of, of of ending Atlas and at the therefore ending assured access to space, which means having two providers, and ending the full capability to go to any mission, which only ULA is capable of doing, was not the intention last year's bill. And so Congress got to work this year and they've, they've improved the situation and they just have a bit more work to do. And I'm confident that they will do it because there really is no disagreement anywhere that they would need to have competition, which you can't have with two providers. And you need to have assured access because space is that important to the U.S., much more important to us even than it is to other nations. And and there is a range of spacecraft that need to go to orbit that only we have the capability to take out. So, you know, these are pretty critical issues, and there's more than one of them. So I believe they'll solve this problem. I just have a, I'm not sure just a quick follow-up note. I mean, if the Atlas could hit a, a wall with the Atlas, so to speak, I mean, there's no thought of uh, that Delta can compensate for that again. Right. So Delta can fly. Delta can fly the Atlas missions. So Delta could satisfy assured access to space. Unfortunately, Delta cannot effectively compete in a commercial marketplace. And so, now that we have a commercial and competitive marketplace, if I can't bring Atlas into that market, you actually don't have a competitive commercial marketplace. Last question. Uh, just two quick clarifications on the GPS three launch contract. Um, before Obama threatened a veto of the defense bill, the best relief ULA could get in this round was four more engines, I believe. Um, two questions are, is that enough that you go ahead and bid on the GPS contract? And would you kind of go ahead and be preparing a bid, expecting something to happen before November 16th and then just not submit it? Or where's sort of your, we all have deadlines. Where's your deadline for when you say, okay, we'll go ahead and do it, and how quickly can you prepare that? So I haven't had an opportunity to read the RFP yet. We only just got this day before yesterday. So when I get back home, I'll, my folks will have gone through it, and they'll know what's in it, and we'll know what we want to do. So I, I really can't answer any of those very specific questions until we've done that. And as we said a minute ago, none of that is relevant unless I have engines that I'm legally allowed to offer. Okay, well, that was a pretty clear statement you made, and I really appreciate that. You said you wouldn't be bidding on a contract if, if there was no RD-180 relief, so um, I, I assume you don't mean that as an empty threat. And I can't violate the law of the land. Right. Um, but is there a possibility that even if there is, you know, some relief, like these four, would you then say, okay, we're, we're good to submit an offer? So are you asking me if the law is signed, is there a possibility I would bid? Right, with the yes. four, which is with the four. You don't need like all 14, just with the four you, you consider making an offer. Depending on what is in the RFP. I have. Um, if it's not like a secret, I want, I want you to launch three more. <laughs> I don't know what's okay. in it until I see it. All right, thank you. All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and start wrapping up, Tori. Gotta get moving to his next event, but he'll be around for another couple of seconds as we can start packing up a minute. And I think Glenn has something. I have some t-shirts. We have t-shirts. Oh. Not a hat. I'll get you a hat. But yeah, <laughs> you're constantly.